Welcome to Madang. I'm Grace Ji Sang Kim, the host of Madang Podcast. Today's wonderful guest is Reverend Dr. Jackie Lewis. She shares about her stories of love and pain, self-love, God is love, white nationalism, breaking boundaries, and her book Fierce Love, and so much more. Stay tuned. Do you try to be a Christian but find church really difficult? Do you try to live faithfully but wrestle with embracing risk? Do you find yourself thinking a lot about who you are becoming? If so, then you need to read some Kierkegaard with us. When we risk getting lost, maybe we can then find faith. To learn more and join over 1,000 others in the group, head to iheartkierkegaard.com. The Buddhist Suchi Foundation and Green Faith invites listeners to join us at Living the Change, a global multi-faith initiative journeying with people of faith, spirit, and conscience to change how we live as part of our response to the climate emergency. Through Living the Change, we aim to catalyze rapid and large reductions of personal greenhouse gas emissions of people of faith, spirit, and conscience as part of the collective pursued efforts to stay below the mean global warming temperature of 1.5 degrees Celsius. We focus specifically on changes that have the biggest impact on individual emissions in the heaviest polluting communities, changing how we travel, eat, and power our homes. Living the Change welcomes everyone who wants to walk gently on Earth together, while concentrating especially on people with the highest carbon footprints. To find out more, please visit www.livingthechange.net or follow us on Twitter and Facebook at Living the Change. Join the only Latina-led and founded Black, Indigenous, and Persons of Color space in North America for people discerning or already in their first three years of church planting. A six-month, once-a-week transformative learning experience will bring some of the best Black and Brown faculty in the country teaching on relevant issues of the day for today's church leader. Cohort 2 begins on January 12, 2022. Space is limited. Apply today. Applications are available for Cohort 2 on our website. Please visit www.passiontoplant.com for more information. Show your support and please order Invisible, which releases tomorrow, available wherever books are sold. Water is a nonprofit educational center and public charity in Silver Spring, Maryland, that focuses on feminist work in religion. Since our founding in 1983, Water has built a growing network of scholars, ministers, and activists around the world who are committed to engaging theological training and scholarship in the service of social change. We promote empowerment, justice, peace, and systematic change. Water transforms religious structures by strengthening women as religious agents and encouraging them to work for inclusive religious communities and an egalitarian future. We have a global impact and international reach. We promote eco-feminist work. We are collaborative and participative as we work in alliance with justice networks worldwide. For sponsorship inquiries, please email madangpodcast.gmail.com. This is Madang, an outdoor living room for guests to share their experiences and their work. I invite you to come in and stay for a while. Welcome to Madang. Today, I have a very special guest, the Reverend Dr. Jackie Lewis, who's an author, an activist, preacher, public theologian toward creating an anti-racist, just fully welcoming society in which everyone has enough. She has her MDiv from Princeton Theological Seminary and a PhD in psychology and religion from Drew University. Uh, Reverend Lewis came to Middle uh, Church in January 2004 and co-founded the Middle Project and the Revolutionary Love Conference with her spouse, the Reverend John Yanka, which, which trained leaders to create a more just society. 
She has been featured on so many broadcasts and on national television. Um, Reverend Lewis has been on the Today Show, All In with Chris Hayes, AM Joy, the Melissa Harris uh, Perry Show, ABC, NBC, PBS, CBS, and so on and so on. She is a highly sought after um, preacher and a speaker, and she's the author of several books, including 10 Essential Strategies for Becoming a Multicultural Congregation, The Power of Stories, A Guide for Leaders in Multiracial, Multicultural Congregations. And today, we are very honored to have her here to discuss her newest book, Fierce Love, A Bold Path to Ferocious Courage and Rule-Breaking Kindness, that can heal the world. Welcome, Reverend Lewis. Thank you so much for coming on my Madame podcast. I know you are super busy with so many things, but thank you so much for coming today. I am so glad to be with you, Reverend Doctor. And don't be calling me Doctor Reverend, just Jack Grace. <laughs> Jack, I'm yeah. so glad to be with you. It's been a long time. I know glad it's been to- so long. It's been so long. Are you well? How are you doing today? Um, I have been ill for the past year. I got ill last October. And uh, for the past few months, I'm getting a little better. So thank you so much for checking in with me. How are you doing? Because I know you're so busy. I need a nap. Okay, that's okay. (laughs) This uh, just, you know, just um, COVID and the fire that the church had last December. But I also got to take off a a few months this summer as a sabbatical, Grace, and did some research and some traveling. So I'm good. I'm good. Oh, that's good. What are you researching now? Are you, are you doing another book besides this newest yeah, yeah. Fierce Love? We got a grant from Lily uh-huh. to go do a, a kind of a tour in the South. And my, and my wow. question was, how does the same Bible religion, uh-huh. so-called religion, mm-hmm. foster white supremacy and lynching and emancipation and resistance, right? How do we, mm-hmm. how do we square that? So John and I got to go together. We had a good time. Oh, that's so <laughs> great. You guys. And, um, and I'm back and here we are. Yeah. Wow. So that's going to be your next book project. Cause it sounds lovely. I think so. I think I'm thinking okay. about how do we get really free? That's my question. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And for that one, when it comes out, you must come back to my Madame podcast. Love to. Thank you so much. I just love this new book of yours. And, you know, so many, uh, you know, great things uh, that people have said. Valerie Kaur wrote, I have never felt a home in any church as I have in Middle Church, a vibrant, multicultural, multi uh, racial community in the heart of New York City. Now, Reverend Dr. Jackie Lewis gives us her ingredients to building a beloved community with fierce love. So I just, you know what, I've been at your church a couple of times and I I participated in revolutionary love. Yes. All your beautiful wisdom to the table. I so appreciate you. So I miss it. So I know you did it on, uh, it was um, online this past year and you still had a huge gathering. Two years in a row. I have to thank my staff and all the like folks who curated with us Excuse me, just let me cough and get that over with. <laughs> Allergic. Sorry. We had two digital conferences. When we shut down the church in March of 2020, the conference was at April, 600 people. And it was the largest conference ever, Grace. Like people <laughs> were able to come because they could do it in their pajamas. Yeah, that again, is amazing. It, right? And we did it again oh, last so year. Good. Uh-huh. And I think that I think the universe smiled upon us that we mm-hmm. had some capacity for doing digital things. And mm-hmm. we had such great cast like you, people who just come, Brian McLaren, Valerie Cord, you know, Ruby Sales. Yeah. So kind of a multi-ethnic, multi-religious cast. And people really responded. Mm -hmm. I think it's one of the most important conferences. So thank you so much for doing it. I hope um, next year would be better in that we can maybe meet in person or make it hybrid. But you hold one of the best conferences. So I really enjoyed uh, attending and participating. And I hope you do many, many more um, years to come. Yeah, so thank you. And for those who don't know the conference, can you tell us a little bit about the conference? Yeah, um, this that was our 
15th conference. And wow. when we first started, Grace, you know, my husband and I were both thinking, how can we teach people how to build multi-ethnic communities? We had been at the Auburn Institute together, and that was kind of a question we had. And over time, we did, you know, how to build that kind of multicultural, multi-ethnic worship, how to use the power of stories to grow leaders. And ultimately, um, about seven years ago, we got to Revolutionary Love. All the young people in Ferguson had been chanting Revolutionary Love, Love, Love in the streets. My friend Valerie Kaur was talking about revolutionary love. Um, Rabbi Michael Lerner was talking about revolutionary love. So it was in the zeitgeist, Serene Jones at the AAR. And, mm -hmm. and it just seemed like it answered a question. What is the real call of humanity? Not the religion of humanity, but the call of humanity to respond to each other, to care for the kids, to care for the world, to care for the earth. And we found artists, activists, lawyers, teachers, teenagers, and theologians, musicians, all came because it was a wider aperture, right? It was a wider aperture. So we have been really excited about that. And now we're asking ourselves, what is actually fierce about that love? And how, how can we make that even deeper in the psyche of American folks and the folks around the globe so we can heal our souls and heal the world? Yeah, that's so wonderful. I've loved attending and participating Isn't in your revolutionary. Great? Oh, it is one of the best you. conferences. So I hope to attend more. Now my son lives in New York, so it might be easier to come in yeah, well, and let, visit. Yeah. Let me say this to, to, your, to our listeners that mm -hmm. what we did this year, uh, just because of the way the world has changed, is we sort of took the Revolutionary Love Conference and deconstructed it like a good sandwich. So there are 10 monthly salons Oh, freedom, isn't that cool? Freedom Rising oh. salons. So that because we had such success putting anti-racist salons in the world. So now, for example, this Wednesday, our first one is rising to indigenous reparations. Uh, we're going to have a, a, a Asian focused, earth focused, African American focused, women focused. So 10 of those. And then the April convening that we're all so used to will still happen April 16, 17 weekend. Isn't that cool? Oh, that is so cool. Actually, that is a great idea. You're just full of great ideas. So I, congratulations on that. that. I think that's great. <laughs> yeah. So thank you for sharing about that. Is there anything else that we need to know about Revolutionary Love? I, I think if people will just go to, like, if you go to revolutionaryloveconference.com, this information is still there. And if you go to middlechurch.org, you can actually Grace, even the conferences you've done with us are still mm -hmm. for sale in our store. So you can find them online also. So just please guys dig around at middlechurch.org and look for Revolutionary Love. And we want you to have access to those tools. So please do feel free to go. Okay. So I hope all the listeners will go and uh, I might be able to post some of those uh, websites up. So, cause it's sometimes, mm -hmm. you know, you're listening and then you can't hear everything. So I will try to post those websites up because I think, so what you're doing is so important. And because you can do some of it online, because not everybody can travel to New York city, That's New right. York city to attend. I think that'd be great. So I'm hoping to go next year. So we'll see what happens so uh, next year, April, 2022. So yep. I know you're going to get a huge crowd it's such an important conference and you get so many important speakers so thank you so much for doing that thank you and I just, yeah so you just mentioned that it's becoming more fierce love and I love the poster behind you and I know you have your book copy so can you hold it up for us congratulations yeah. on it I love the cover and I really really love the book because it was like so much of your life in there. Oh my so gosh. I'm like crying and laughing and so <laughs> forth. So tell us, how did you begin writing this book? Yeah. Thank you, Grace. You know, it took yeah. it took a long time. Oh, I did, did I didn't, oh it did. I I was cooking this book for about nine years. Um, <gasps> as as we were as we were developing revolutionary love, as I was mm -hmm preaching to my multi-ethnic, multicultural congregation, as you and I, Grace, were mourning the world, mm -hmm. mourning mm -hmm. the violence in the world, mourning 9-11, mourning the, um, the crippling racism that leads to the crisis at the border and leads to the anti-Asian sentiment this last year, leads to the 
killings of Ahmaud Arbery and uh, um, Breonna Taylor, George Floyd. I was just like, oh my God, what is wrong with us? Seriously, what is wrong? And how can we get better? And I started thinking about a grown-up God. You've probably heard me talk about like, what if our grown-up, what if we had a grown-up faith? What if our faith would grow up? But I realized, Grace, that actually I was practicing something different that everyone could access. That I was had learned how to really love myself in these last years as an antidote to the hate, that I had deeper relationships with my posse, my family, my dad, you know, even relationships that had been fraught that we were just healing them. And I was just beginning to take more seriously the command to love God, labor, love neighbor, love self, love God, neighbor, self. So this came out of my body finally as nine practices, three directed toward self, neighbor, world, that anyone can do anytime, that are intersectional in their focus, Grace. Like this is the work you do. This is the work I do. We know that we can't stay in our ethnic bubble. We can't stay in our gender bubble. We can't stay in our theological bubble and survive. So I'm calling people in to Ubuntu, which I know you know is this amazing philosophy that says a person is a person through other people. Um, is this true, my Korean friend, that there's some kind of concept called Han? Is that right? That Han, Han. is like a uh -huh. Han is like a shared, what a shared grief or shared feeling of yeah, uh huh, so yeah. In that context, right? When you're hurt, I cry right? When your children are hungry, my stomach growls. Or when you rejoice, I rejoice. And there's this interrelated connectedness between humankind that I want our people to find their way to so that we understand that our surviving and our thriving are dependent on each other. So that's yeah. what the book calls out. I know. It's so beautiful. Like, I just... And it's so inspirational because you are able to be so vulnerable in the book mm -hmm. and share, you know, some of these deep stories and experiences from your childhood all the way up to present time. Like, I was like, wow, I wish I had the courage. So I love the title, Fierce Love. And I thought maybe you can put courage love too. <laughs> but it, it is yeah. so beautiful because, you know, some people think they know you and that you know, I don't know you all, you know, know you like very personally, professionally a bit more, but to hear some of these stories, it was so moving and so touching and so inspirational that I thought I should write more books like you because you have like set the standard up so high for me. <laughs> I'm like, your book was so inspirational to me. And I'm hoping that so many people in the pews and outside the pews, in the classrooms, in the seminaries too, that people will just read it and be encouraged by this fierce love that you're speaking about and talking about. So one part of the book, you said, you know, how do you learn to love yourself? Right, so right. yeah, can you share us? Because I think... Some of us, you know, this past year, I've been very ill and it, it yeah. was very hard to love myself because I was afraid I may die. I may, something may happen to me and I'm going to be crippled or something. And, or for many other reasons, people have so many reasons to not love themselves. That's right. That's right, Grace. Yeah. And including so, the sure. way that it can feel like our bodies betray us. I mean, there's, yes, right. I mean, I think about all the people who, um, who got sick who got COVID and they like, they were doing the right thing and they got sick or they had a, the inoculations and they had a breakthrough. And so they feel like this body doesn't work, right? As we age, we can like, this body doesn't work. Um, black, brown, Asian people in a, in a white uh, dominant culture that is still racist, that my body doesn't work. My gender doesn't work. So how do we learn to, to do it? I mean, I think it is actually brave. It, is, it does require courage. It requires ferocious courage. Yeah, uh, it really does. Because you know what? Uh -huh. You know what? We're not taught it, right? We're not taught it. We're not taught. I mean, you're a wonderful Korean leader. I'm an African American leader. No one said girls should love themselves. You know, yeah. there's a sense of right false humility, and so what I what I believe is 
it requires the practice of a muscle. Like we work out, we grow a muscle, we grow a muscle, we, when we're running, we, we grow ab muscles, we turn our attention to the environment, Grace, and we say, I'm gonna reduce my carbon footprint with that same intentionality. I'm hoping that readers will increase their self-love as, as an essential practice. Like you're gonna floss your teeth, you're gonna brush your teeth, you're gonna drink water, and you're gonna focus on yourself as the object of your affection, right? Like the unconditional, unpossessive delight in yourself as a building block to loving your children, to loving your partner, to loving your family, to loving your congregation, to loving your students, because you actually cannot do it. You actually can't love without loving the self. How? Uh, taking an inventory, right? There's a, there's a section in the book about sort of using your stories as a, as a minefield, as, as a, or as a, let's make it a better metaphor, as a, a, a forest or as a, a farming place for self-love. I have survived trauma. I have resisted, you know, oppression. I have um, turned my attention toward love and been able to be a good lover. Those kinds of stories remind us that we're beautiful, that we're made in God's image, that we're fabulous. And as we rehearse them, it's like it rewires our neurotransmitters. Like it just changes our story. So I'm really encouraging our readers to take an inventory, to go through this narrative process of checking out their stories, to tell the truth to themselves, about themselves, and tell the truth to others, because then you're not carrying a bunch of junk around about yourself, and to really make a process of letting go all the stuff that's in your brain that says, I'm not, and to focus on, I am. Oh, thank you so much. That's so beautiful. And, you know, I really think your book is uh, a book for all ages from young kids, all the way till elderly. And so, you know, this day and age with social media, there is so much like not no lack of self love. Right. So I'm hoping that young kids, especially young girls will grab your book fierce love, and learn that it's so important to to do the self-love because if you can't, you know, your world can fall apart and there's suicide, you know, young teenage suicides and Absolutely. it's hurting themselves. Absolutely. So I, yeah. So your book is so powerful. Yeah. I hope that grace, the way you say that makes me think, you know, I'll bet you some, like some of the stories in here are grown-up stories, but I think there's a lot in here that young people could read and parents could read with them. Oh my so goodness. We, yes. right? We're trying to have some book guides that help that, uh -huh. uh, but just like read it with your, kid especially I think young teenagers preteens could yeah. really get with this mm -hmm. book I think you need to talk with your publisher and get a reading guide with parents because mm -hmm. I think your book is just full of stories that actually young kids teens can relate to mm -hmm. and you know my kids are younger you know my youngest just went to college and you know these are stories that you share in there that are so powerful and I think in our wider society we've forgotten about storytelling we yes. are not very good storytellers i think in other societies like african society and asian yeah. society we are better at storytelling but here when we live in the western world we don't and that's why i thought your book was so powerful i'm hoping like sunday school you know programs will be able Ooh. to use your book it is so important so it that's why it was like a book of all ages from young kids um, some of the, you know, some of the stories are kind of uh, more deeper, and I think maybe parents could read it with them. So the, yeah. I think you really need to get uh, a, a reading guide, even for us older people to read it with too. I well, think that'd be got, great, like a study guide. Uh -huh. For everybody who pre-orders, there is a there is a book, there is a book club package. It is a book club package that you can get, and it is journaling, it is questions, it is that deep search thing, it's um, pull quotes, just a reminder, but your idea of a book guide directed toward kids and parents, yeah. I'm taking that to my publisher today. Yeah, I, I think you need to. Great idea. <laughs> I think you need to, because I think, you know, love is the most important thing, and we're lacking that, and I see Absolutely. it among young kids. A lot of them uh, fall into depression, and I think, yeah 
you know, the, in the news recently with social media, people think that, in, you know, young kids are mostly on Instagram and not so much on Facebook. So in Instagram, all the pictures are gorgeous, you know, so everybody's right. living their life. But <laughs> so right. people fall into depression and they have this yep. self-hatred and self, That's they right. can't love themselves. That's so right. I think your book is so important. I, I, I just got goosebumps reading your stories and reading the book. And well, there's another part of, yeah, go ahead. No, you go ahead, please. Okay. Go ahead. And then there was another part where you wrote about uh, the God I'm most sure of is called love. Ooh. And you know what? We've, I've heard that so many times, like, you know, we sing about God is love, but to read it actually in your book, it was very powerful for me. So for our listeners, can you kind of unpack that you, you wrote yeah. on page 65, if those who um, have their, <laughs> the God I'm most sure of is called love. love. So if you can yeah. unpack it for us. I will, Grace. Thank you for that. Listen, part of what you, part of what I think you're noticing, um, and I, it, honestly, I did my audio book and I frightened myself. I just decided that I've hit an age and a time in my life where the truth will set me free. And I just wanted to be honest to say some of the stuff that's been constructed about God, Grace, you're like, really? Come on, really? <laughs> that's just, that's just a lot. <laughs> uh, I, I say that every day. <laughs> that's, that's a lot. Every day I'm thinking, and I think that with my students, I'm like, right? where did this all come, come from? from? Like, what happened? You know, like, <laughs> why did we do that? And so, what about if we just stripped it down? You know, what if we stripped it down? What is the essential to the thing about God? And it's it's ubiquitous, right, Grace? It's in all the cultures and all the religions. There's a sense of a power, a, a flourishing, a, a delight in the world and love and just juicy, joyful, jouissance, you know, thick, um, sacrificial. We know what it looks like. We know what it smells like. We know what it tastes like. And they were like, well, there's a Trinity and okay, well then there's, you know, we got to step over the stone and you got to stand up and sit down and fight, fight, fight and say this creed and go through this thing and get ordained. And like, what happened? <laughs> so I just thought <laughs> I've got, like, I don't have time, you know? And so every day that I can just preach love, you know, and to, and to describe it, you know, like I think about the beautiful book you did on Jesse Jackson, you know, Keep Hope Alive. Oh, you know, thank so, you so like, much. So beautiful. But love is hope, right? Love is defying the odds. Love is standing, watching your friend shot on a balcony and picking up his mantle and doing the work. Love is, you know, jumping in front of Ruby Sales and, and taking the bullet, Jonathan. You know, love is when your baby is crying, you stay up all night. We know what that is. And that is what God is about. God is good. God is love. So I just wanted to be honest because as a theologian, right? And as a scholar, all the barriers, Grace, to just entering into love as a, as a way to be, like, I want the barriers gone. I want little kids to get it that when they're kind to each other in the playground, that's faith. That's being bound together. That's religion. I want teenagers to get it when they when they actually say no to bullying. That's fierce love. I want mommies and daddies to get it. You can say no to your kids and that's love. You know, they need boundaries, right? Um, I want the church to get it that we can't say, how do we say we love God and hate our brothers and sisters? That's biblical, dude. So can we just get down to what the writer of first john says god is love and everyone who takes up residence in love takes up residence in god and god takes up residence in them what god is love if you live in love you're living in god and god is living in you that's the trans teen that's the queer mom that's the you know divorced dad that's the people living on the border under foil blankets everywhere love is god is and if we really believed that we would treat each other differently we would live differently and i that's my that's my calling in come on everybody let's just love each other yeah amen wow and i see that in your church so you know, I visited your church and you, you know, everyone is welcome in your church. And that's not, 
that's not true for every church, you know, there's classism in the church, there's racism in the church, there's, uh, you know, bias and homophobia, there's so much in the church. But you, and, you know, when people ask me, oh, what's a good example of a church like that practices intercultural ministry, or, you know, how they embrace people of, I always name your church, because I think you are doing it so beautifully. And I just, I can't think of another church that's doing it as well as your church. So I'm just so grateful for you and your ministry. And in the book, um, there's another a part where when you're continuing to talk about love, you said love crosses borders and boundaries. It makes new cultural rules. It cares for the stranger. And, you know, I love, like, I didn't love your story where you got into the accident, but the parallel that you made with that in the Good Samaritan and what the woman did for you is so powerful. So if you have not purchased Fierce Love, People have to buy it to read even that section because actually I found that very moving that you went through this horrible accident and you were able to kind of reflect on it. So for those who haven't read your book yet, can you just share a little bit about mm. that quote and then your car accident and, yeah. you know, cause you, you share so much pain and hurt in your book too, Ooh, which I'm yeah. so grateful for because when people see you on social media, you got this million dollar smile. <laughs> And and sometimes look, I just want to curl up in a ball and cry. But why, you, right? you don't see that. And then so we yeah. always have this misconception on social media. And that's what always scares me with young girls, especially. But it, yeah. it affects young teen boys, too. Sure, it does. That people look at social media and they get all depressed and they get they don't have the self-love and they just want to hurt themselves and, and commit suicide. So can you share us about that and about yeah. love cross borders and boundaries? It's so beautiful. Thank you, Grace. You are you're so kind and generous to ask that that question. I when I was 22, I tell the story in the book that I had a, I was driving to a wedding and I had a pretty terrible car accident. I flipped my car over. I mean, flipped it over uh, up on the roof, on the tires, on the roof, on the tires. I could not. And let me say, when your t- car is getting ready to flip over, you know it before it happens. Like you're like, oh, this car is getting ready to flip over and it does. And it was so scary and so horrible and so hard. And the, the, the man I was with um, was hurt worse than I had his, you know, his hand was abraded and we totaled the car um, and it was really scary. And I was alone. You know, um, when I read the book, I, when I write the book, I tell the story of just feeling so alone. My parents are kind of annoyed with me and I'm only four hours away, bless their hearts, and they don't really come to take care of me. And I'm just only 22. And I'm just like, I got no money, the car's totaled. I'm standing in this hospital lobby and I'm just feeling sorry for myself. And this woman looks, is staring at me and she walks over to me and asks me what's wrong. And just, I start crying and I tell her all the things. The miracle in this story, the true miracle in the story is I'm a skinny black girl from Chicago in, you know, Windsor, Ontario, Canada with this white Canadian lady. And it's like 1982. So we haven't really overcome. You know? Yeah. Uh, and she takes me to a hotel and she checks me in and she buys me food and she gets me to my rental car and she picks me up the next day and she just loves me grace i mean unconditionally like what there's nothing i did to deserve it there's nothing i did to demand it there's nothing i could have done to earn it and i call her the good canadian because it's so much like that story that jesus tells in the gospels of what neighbor love looks like this samaritan this hated mixed race person is the one that shows up as a lover to the man who's hurt on the street. And this isn't Luke's gospel. I love that. Uh, It's beautiful. But she was a real person. She was not a parable. She was a real person who went all the way across everything comfortable. Across the whole, across the hospital lobby, she picks me up and puts me in the car. Women don't do that. In every way that she could build, she could break the rules. She broke the rules for love. And look, my friend Linda is a Muslim and broke the rules and invited Sharon 
a rabbi to speak at the Women's March, right? My friends, my Black friends, male friends broke the rules and did die-ins in DC when they were terrified because they know they could get arrested and hurt, right? Um, you know, Wajahad Ali is my secular Muslim buddy who shows up all the time. Uh, Ari Hart goes to um, Kosovo to pull people out of, of danger. Good people break the rules all the time for love. And I want our listeners, my readers to think, I too can break the rules for love and show up in extraordinary ways and simple ways. Kindness to the older person in your building, your teenager that you wanna throttle, give them grace. We can break the rules and heal each other with love. That's so beautiful. So thank you so much because just hearing you is, it's so powerful. And then the narrative in the book is so powerful. You are such a powerful writer and it's so beautifully written. So thank you. So you just gave a little glimpse of that story, but it's I hope glimpse. the readers, yeah, Please. the readers will get it. Now. Yeah, you can now. Yeah. And get, and <laughs> and get then, you a copy. And then get the book. Yeah, get the copy. And then, you know, your, your book is full of stories, but then it's, it touches on big topics like love and it also touched on white nationalism. Yes, yes. So do you want to say a little bit about I white do. nationalism? I okay, do. yeah, please share it because it is it is problematic. So it is. Yeah. It is. Mm -hmm. I wrote I wrote my way to that. Like right, I like you have been just devastated by I mean, we love this church. We love this church that we're called to serve. Um, we serve in these academies and you know, we feel called to serve. We write in the world of white publishing. And, and underneath, inside the Christianity that, that saves us is white nationalism. And we've seen it raise its ugly head so much. I mean, it isn't new. Our nation was not founded with you or I in mind. The, the Constitution, does, I'm three-fifths of a person. Thank you so much. Um, Recently, Jim Forbes told me it's harder to be three-fifths of a person in the South than it is in New York. <laughs> that's, a, that's the whole thing. Uh, but, you know, where is it not? It is, it is like air. It's in the way we do media. It's in the way we do social media. It's in the way we do capitalism. It's in the way so many people make so much more money than the people in their than their employees. Um, it's in the way the voting rights are being eroded, women's rights are being eroded. It's in the way that a, a reality TV star can become the president and set the whole nation against your people, Grace, Asian people and, and Black people. It's in the way that the so-called protest that was the January 6th insurrection, you know, just murdered people. Uh, in the name of fascism. And especially as a theologian, I'm really wanting to call out the way the church sets up white rage, you know, as a sacrament and black grief as something to be scoffed at. Uh, the church is so much a tool of white nationalism. The church danced with white nationalism and the Ku Klux Klan is the result. You know, um, the, 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 the statues to whiteness, the um, contests of whiteness, the cost of whiteness, the internalization of whiteness is sadly a part of the American fabric. And I wrote it as truthfully as I could, playfully, I say I'm on the nice white people tour because I mean, I'm calling in white allies, white accomplices, white curious, white people who are ready to be repairers of the broken places, white people who are ready to say, this white thing is not working for me either. And it's happening, right? It's a multi-ethnic movement in response to George Floyd's murder. So I'm saying, read the book white people, Asian people, Latinx people, black people, indigenous people. And together let's make a movement against what I call whiteness and confess how it traps all of us, including white people. And let's get free mm -hmm. together. Oh, that's so true. And, you know, we've made 
Christianity white, we've made God white and Jesus white. So it is so deep rooted and the negative, the negative effects is killing people, Catast- hurting people. Catastrophic, yeah. catastrophic mm-hmm. results. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I'm so glad your book, you were able to touch on that because it's so important, especially now after Trump to, I think, to name it and, 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 and share how horrible it is. So thank you for doing that. I know we don't have much more time, but I also wanted to say uh, on on a last note, you know, you wrote that every human life is precious. Mm -hmm. Every and each human is divine. And I really like that because, you know, you in your ministry, you know, you, you know, you welcome everybody doesn't matter what your sexuality, your economic or your ability or your religion, you are welcome into the middle church. So, you know, and I love, you know, you say that each human is divine. So I teach at Earlham School of Religion, which is Quaker. Yeah. I'm not Quaker, but they all that they believe, you know, that of God in all of you, in each person. So I just find it so beautiful. So can you just um, kind of expand on that as we wrap up this? Because I know you have busy, busy schedule all day long. Oh, and I'm so glad to, I'm so glad to just have time out with you, Grace, really. Um, <laughs> you set a beautiful table in this madang. I appreciate oh, it. Oh, thank yeah, you. Thank you. you. I'm so glad that you're mm-hmm. on my madang. It's always been a dream madang. of mine. So it's thank beautiful. You. Yeah, thank you. I think I really take seriously, <clears throat> and I'm a Christian person, right? But I'm a universalist person. And because I just really believe God, the holy love, wants to be known by all of us and will, and will seek us out and find the way and say the words and chase us down and show us in nature, show us in the books, show us in the music, show us in the dance, you know, the curve of an arm. So I take really seriously that, that scripture that we said earlier about, like those who live in love, live in God and God lives in them. Like who doesn't love somebody? So if God is in you, as you love your child, as you love the world, as you love your neighbor, as you love your partner, you, you host the divine. That's what, that's what we're being told. And if it were just a Christian thought, that would be one thing, but it's a ubiquitous thought. It's, a, it's an Eastern religion thought. It's a, it's, a, it's a thought in many contexts that we are the divine spark, that we can bow to the divine in each of us. And so if we take that seriously, Grace, then who doesn't belong? Like, you know, the Hebrew scriptures talk about, you know, you, you might be seeing a stranger and you don't know you're, you might be entertaining angels. You know, you might be entertaining a messenger from God or you might be entertaining God. Um, to take seriously the embodiment of goodness and love and divinity in each person is to treat each person as though they're worthy of being treated with dignity and respect and they get to have health care, and they get to go to the bathroom they want to go to, right? And they get to love yeah. who they want to love. Like, <laughs> what is wrong with us, Grace? Like, you- before we started recording, we're like, what's wrong with people? I really care about this bathroom thing. Why? <laughs> Why do you care about it? Why can't that little child just go, like, it's bad yeah. enough? Uh-huh. Leave, it out. leave them alone. You know, yeah. let, let's leave everybody alone and let them love who they love and be who they be and show some kindness and some curiosity about each other and stop acting like we know what God wants because we don't have any idea what God wants. And how can you say you love God and hate your brother? And how can you say God made everybody in God's image except for the people you hate? Then you want to crush that one to the ground. It's just like hypocrisy and foolishness. That's real strong, but that's how I feel. So everybody, take take a breath. And ask ourselves, do we really love God? Do we really believe God is the engineer of the world? If we do, then we need to take a step back from the judgments as though God made mistakes and as though God doesn't know what she's doing because she knows what she's doing. And let's just relax. This is my hope that the book that Fierce Love like cuts through the garbage and cuts through the divisive rhetoric and says, here is what we can agree on. 
We can agree that you're beautiful just as you are. We can agree that there's something about you that teaches me something about God. And if that's true, I ought to be nicer to you. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's very I like that. <laughs> Just be nicer, <laughs> right? I you like don't have to, to write a book. Just like be nice to people. <laughs> <laughs> and I think if everyone read your book, everyone can be right? nicer. Because nice. be yeah, nice. because I think reading your story, like I said, it's so powerful, and you know. You, you shared a lot about your evangelical upbringing and I just, oh I, that's so relatable to me. And then when these bad things happen, it was always like, oh, because I did this now, God's punishing me. Yeah. I live like that so much too. So your book was so relatable. I think it will just touch everyone, young and old, Christian, non-Christian, just someone who's bored can just sit there and you weave in such important messages with each of your stories as you reflect i'm just so grateful for your book fierce love i know you said you took a long time to write it but i'm so grateful that you did so i hope all our listeners will get out and buy your book fierce love a bold path to ferocious courage and rule-breaking kindness that can heal the world so how can they um follow you and stay in touch yeah. with you yeah thank and you thank tell you tell us where your church is too yeah. okay so well you know, our church is everywhere right now. We, we, um, you know, we closed our church in March of 2020, like most folks did due to COVID and people really came from Japan and China and Ireland and stuff to church. Uh, and then we had a fire in December of 2020. So uh, literally our physical building is gone. We're renting a place now, but the very best way to come to church, if you're not in Manhattan, or even if you are, is middlechurch.org. Just go there at 1145 on a Sunday. If you're chilling on a Saturday night and you want to hear good music, middlechurch.org. Worship, hear great music. If you want to catch some stuff, middlechurch.org slash programs. Look at the Rev Love Conference. And follow me at Rev Jackie Lewis. I'm Rev Jackie Lewis everywhere. Uh, Insta, uh, Twitter, Facebook. And the book is Fierce Love. And it is a Penguin Random House book. And you can find it there, or you can find it on my personal website, JackieJLewis.com. Uh, oh, and Grace is going to put links in the thing. And yeah, we'll, we hope and, that you'll find uh, yeah, and um, it's available hard copy and ebook. You did the hard copy audiobook? and ebook. Yeah, and then you did the audiobook. Yes, okay. I did. And so, so can, that's great because I know yeah. more and more people love the audiobooks. They just want to listen to it as they're cooking or driving and so forth. So I hope they get your books um, as soon as they can because there's so much in there. And, you know, I it would take days for us to sit down uh, on Madang to discuss it all. But I just thank you so much for writing it, for taking the time because I know you're so busy. You got your revolutionary love project. You got your church. You got your family. You got so many things going on. So thank you so much for writing it. And I know, and thank you so much for coming as a guest on Madang. It's such a pleasure to see you. It's a pleasure to see you, friend. Yeah, and and I hope to see you. You set such a beautiful table. I would come anytime. And oh, I hope okay. to see you. Thank when you come to Manhattan, let me know. Yeah. And let's get together, okay? And okay, have in yes. person, Madame. Okay. okay. Yes, yeah. yes. That will be fabulous. Thank you so much, Reverend you, Dr. Grace. Jackie Lewis. Thank you so much. And I hope that you come back to Madang again. I would Thank love you. to come. Thank you so much. Do you try to be a Christian, but find church really difficult? Do you try to live faithfully, but wrestle with embracing risk? Do you find yourself thinking a lot about who you are becoming? If so, then you need to read some Kierkegaard with us. When we risk getting lost, maybe we can then find faith. To learn more and join over 1,000 others in the group, head to iheartkierkegaard.com. The Buddhist Suchi Foundation and Green Faith invites listeners to join us at Living the Change a global multi-faith initiative, journeying with people of faith, spirit, and conscience to change how we live as part of our response to the climate emergency. Through Living the Change, we aim to catalyze rapid and large reductions of personal greenhouse gas emissions of people of faith, spirit, and conscience as part of the collective pursued efforts to stay below the mean global warming temperature of 1.5 degrees Celsius. 
We focus specifically on changes that have the biggest impact on individual emissions in the heaviest polluting communities, changing how we travel, eat, and power our homes. Living the Change welcomes everyone who wants to walk gently on Earth together, while concentrating especially on people with the highest carbon footprints. To find out more, please visit www.livingthechange.net or follow us on Twitter and Facebook at Living the Change. Join the only Latina-led and founded Black, Indigenous, and Persons of Color space in North America for people discerning or already in their first three years of church planting. A six-month, once-a-week transformative learning experience will bring some of the best Black and Brown faculty in the country teaching on relevant issues of the day for today's church leader. Cohort 2 begins on January 12, 2022. Space is limited. Apply today. Applications are available for Cohort 2 on our website. Please visit www.passiontoplant.com for more information. Show your support and please order Invisible, which releases tomorrow, available wherever books are sold. Water is a nonprofit educational center and public charity in Silver Spring, Maryland, that focuses on feminist work in religion. Since our founding in 1983, Water has built a growing network of scholars, ministers, and activists around the world who are committed to engaging theological training and scholarship in the service of social change. We promote empowerment, justice, peace, and systematic change. Water transforms religious structures by strengthening women as religious agents and encouraging them to work for inclusive religious communities and an egalitarian future. We have a global impact and international reach. We promote eco-feminist work. We are collaborative and participative as we work in alliance with justice networks worldwide. For sponsorship inquiries, please email madangpodcast.gmail.com.